This is a presentation given by Brian Swan at Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2015, entitled Welsh, Norman and Irish Interactions Through the Past. Wales is the closest part of mainland Britain to Ireland, so migration across the Irish Sea to Wales in both directions has occurred throughout recorded history. Welsh family history is unique, but in some respects has parallels to Irish family history. These unique features of Welsh family history will be reviewed by Brian in this presentation. The migration of Anglo-Norman families into Ireland and then later waves of migration via plantation settlements has given rise to a whole range of surnames in Ireland whose origins are now being investigated by the combination of careful Y-DNA analysis and family reconstructions. Brian Swan worked in the pharmaceutical industry most of his working life and began family history in 1967. He's a founder member of the Norfolk, Difford and West Surrey Family History Societies, a member of the Society of Genealogists since 1972, and a member of ISOG since 2006. In 2009, he was instrumental in helping persuade Family Tree DNA to sponsor a vastly enlarged DNA area at Who Do You Think You Are at London Olympia which has contributed to the growth in awareness of the power of combining DNA and documentary research in the 21st century. His wife is Welsh. He has a long-standing interest in the history of Wales, with special affinities to Glamorganshire and West Wales. Brian starts off his presentation talking about the wonderful characteristics of the Welsh and what makes them so wonderful. <laughs> So you get wonderful things like this, you know, what is your Welsh warrior name that you can go on a site and look at? And how did you learn to say this? Which, of course, everyone who comes from Wales can manage to say. I, I can manage it about halfway through, um, but at least, at least you, you, you may know that Lan, which is here, is, is church in Wales. So that's always pretty useful in the names of all the villages. Um, and the time you thought that Port Holbrook looked like New York, um, in a lovely St. David's Day outfit if you were a girl, um, doing maths in Welsh, um, etc. Okay, we all have to do a little bit of, of the re revision that we, we've been through today, but as, as you know from, from other talks, Y SNPs are now becoming very important. Single base change on the Y chromosome defines the branch of the tree, essentially irreversible. Um, Y -SNP, I, I always like this analogy, Y SNPs define the major branches of the tree down to the twigs, the Y SDRs define the leaves. The SDR patterns can be used to assign haplogroups, groups, and there's an assurance scheme, but the Y SNPs overrule Y SDRs. You must have the same SNPs for SDRs to match. And the Y chromosome in general does not recombine fertilization, so does not scramble its DNA. If it did, we could forget about doing any of the Y chromosome family history. We'd all be doing autosomal DNA and we would be stuck at about 1800. So I'm a really, really big fan of, of Y chromosome projects. Essentially, if you want to get before about 1800, in my opinion, that's where you need to get to. So I'm sorry, ladies, you know, sooner or later you're going to have to go out and recruit that man to help you get forward. So that's it, just in diagram form. The STRs out here measure the leaves on the end of the tree. The SNPs measure the passages here out towards the leaves. And other people today have, have talked in, in far more detail than I'm going to talk about how you can drill down into that and get into the SNPs. Um, again, the example by a gentleman called Ian MacDonald has this lovely descent, as we've said, from Y chromosome Adam all the way down here to U106. These are SNPs that take you down here. And I love this diagram, which again just shows you from that U106 SNP at the top here, what's happened in the branching pattern since, well, this is April 2015, but it's just a very graphic illustration of the explosion of activity that's happened in this year over the past couple of years. I have to recommend books. Um, Debbie's two books that are here, in case you haven't seen them. Emily's book, again, I highly recommend as a way to look at genetic genealogy, the basics and beyond, if you, if you want to get into that. 
And I must mention this, um, only because I've been on the stand here, and a number of people do not seem to be aware of, of the, the British surname Atlas. Um, it's, a, it's a classic thing that happens at all the talks in, in, in Britain with the Guild of One Name Studies. But it's an atlas put together in, in 2003 based on the 1881 census, which gives you a wonderful way of finding out the distribution of surnames in England, Wales, and Scotland. So if you're looking about people migrating into Ireland, it's a really useful way to find out what's the size of the problem that you're dealing with. And the problem you face in, in doing Welsh family history, or at least I face, is, is I live down here in Camberley. And the records I want are at the National Library of Wales. Down here I have a particular interest in Pembrokeshire, as will become apparent, and of course up in London. So you always need to be in three places at the same time. And even though we like to think a lot of is online, I, you know only too well there's always a mass of stuff sitting in the record offices that you can't get to. So there's a small group of us that occasionally goes up to Aberystwyth um, in August to, to look at the material in the National Library of Wales. And I also regret with ever more passing time that I'm not an academic and have access to all the university library facilities that they have in terms of books, etc. You're always struggling, I think, with one hand behind your back. So I call that the record office's triangulation problem. Um, mention a little bit about recruitment. Obviously, it's a key, absolute key element of strategy. My experience is never underestimate the amount of time both to construct the family trees and select and recruit the people to test. If you listen to people here, you think this is, this is, this is easy to do. I find it, in fact, by far the most time consuming to do is to recruit the right people to do the testing. Um, in particular, conversations around who's going to pay, are you going to pay completely, you're going to split it 50-50, etc., etc. Um, you have to adjust the, co the conversation, and for larger surname projects, it's impractical to research all the family trees involved. And of course, with Wales, that's a very, very significant problem because of the patronymic surnames and the incidents of, of, of surnames involved, as we will talk about. Um, there's some wonderful books looking at the migration between in, in the Celtic world. Um, Jean Manco has talked about some of those here. Um, a gentleman called John Cock has been mentioned also in, in this regard. Um, I managed to get hold of this book in, in, in this August, although it was published in 2007, and it's certainly the most detailed atlas I'm, I'm aware of, of artefacts that have been discovered both in, in England and in, and in Ireland, things like um, these Ogham stones, the Celtic crosses, things that, that are found a lot in Wales and in Ireland, showing a mutual migration. Um, there's only one problem, and that is if you want to buy it now, it costs a mere £999 on, uh, on Amazon to get hold of your copy. So I have one out there at the moment on interlibrary loan, but it has some wonderful diagrams in it showing the relationship of various artefacts be between the various places. And again, from, from this sort of map, you, you get people in Ireland migrating out into Wales in the 6th to 9th centuries and, and so on. I said through things like Ogham Script, Celtic crosses, these sorts of locations. So there's always been a movement both from Ireland into Wales, and to some extent you learn if there's a migration in one direction, there always tends to be a bit of a, a migration in the reverse direction. Um, and with surnames, um, or Welsh surnames, if you look at the incidents, the top ten Surnames in Wales have an incidence of about 55% of the population. In England, the 10 most common give you 5%. So you're dealing with a, a, you know, an overwhelming preponderance of very common surnames in Wales. And that's just, the, again, the rank order of the 50 most common surnames in England and Wales. One of the things I, I've, one of the books I found useful in, in my thinking about this, this overall area, although it's quite old, it is a book that was put together by William Rees, which is a historical atlas of Wales, um, came out in 1967-1972. It, it may have been updated in various bits, but I've never seen it yet updated in its whole, something that certainly would be done to modern standard. But again, he talks in here about, uh, you know, distribution of pottery, Roman Britain, Roman Wales, early dynasties in Wales, isolation of Wales. 
then the monastic orders, um, the Norman conquest we're talking about, and then pictures of, of West Wales and so on. Yeah, the, the medieval bishopric, the bishoprics, Welsh monastic houses. I don't know of any place where that sits there in, in one book um, at the time. <coughs> and again, with, with relevance to, 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 to Ireland, um, this is a map of Wales that, done in the time of West Wales under the time of Henry, Henry I. And you can see nothing relates to the sort of county, the, the, the county boundaries you're aware of at the moment. As the Normans have come in, the counties, counties have been divided up. You have these Norman lords in charge of, of various parts, you know, Warwick, Warwick down here, De Laundra in, in the area around Kidwelly, um, an area that I've had a particular interest in, which is Chemice in, in North Pembrokeshire, which is the Martin family, the Clare family up here in Keridigion, which is involved with the family that um, crossed in 1169, 1170. Um, Haverford West, Milford Haven, which of course was a really important sailing port in those days to get, to get across. And then further, further afield, if you like, from, from, from that, this is, this is Wales, about 1200. You have the Marshall family here. These are, these are William Marshall, who was Earl of Pembroke, and from about 1260, well, 1215 to 1219 was de facto ruler of England. He's the most powerful person in, when, at, after the death of King John um, in, in the minority. Um, Fitzmartins are still there. The king owns certain amounts. You know, to launder the Barreo's family out here. Marshall lands around here. And, and these are the Marshall lords, lordships in, in, in Wales, which, again, I don't know if that has any sort of parallel, really, in Irish history, but they were very important in controlling all of these borderlands in Wales. And again, this is just really with the passage of time. This is the Treaty of Montgomery, which involved um, Llewellyn and Griffith. I haven't really got time to talk about Welsh history in its overall context, but of course Welsh history has just as complicated a history as Ireland does. Um, and again, you have, to, you have to buy one or two good overview books to, to, to deal with that. But certainly in the first 250 years, really, it was all about the Norman barons that invaded into the southern part of Wales, and they invaded into there, of course, because that was the best farmland. That was, you know, the, where the, the where 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 the, the, the largest tracts of, of low-lying land were. Um, so they spread out to, to the west here, out to Pembrokeshire, fairly rapidly. They they were in, they were into what was Newport here in about 1069. Um, and they arrived at, at Pembroke and the castle there in about 1093 by a, by a raid down down from um, down from Montgomeryshire. So the whole of the, 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 this sort of South Wales and, and the borderline into Wales was was subdued fairly quickly by the Normans. Um, but conquering North Wales and into Mid Wales took that much longer. And really, it wasn't until Edward the First when when that changed. And other people have, have, have nice websites to show how many castles there are in Ireland. I think Wales, in fact, has even more castles per square mile than, or per square hundred miles than, um, than Ireland has. So again, this is, this is, this is Pembrokeshire. Um, Pembroke Castle is, is down here. But it just gives you a feel as to how many stone castles and earthwork castles there are scattered all over this part of Wales. You know, a huge, a huge number. Um, some of these are quite interesting. We, we were actually up at this one at New, in, in Nevin earlier this year because it happens to be known that that castle was, was built in about 1135 and was abandoned by about 1196. So it provides a very interesting castle in terms of the history of castle building because it was in the transition, if you like, from, from the, the classic Motton Bailey, you know, wooden earth castles to stone castles. Um, so masses of castles down there in Wales. Again, just to show the Normans hold on the, on the peninsula. And as someone has said, the, uh, the Normans coming in, into Wales, or I guess into England, was probably the biggest land grab in history. I just have to talk a little bit about how I got into interest in Pembrokeshire. Um, people have heard me speak before know a fair amount about this. Um, my middle name is Picton, which, is, which essentially comes from West Wales. It's one of these Anglo-Norman sur surnames that, that, that invaded into there. 
it's scattered around these, these various um, parishes in, in Wales. Um, particularly I was interested in this gentleman, Sir Thomas Pickton, who um, was actually served as a commander of the 3rd Division under Wellington, was killed at the Battle of Waterloo. He's, he's now buried in St Paul's Cathedral. Because it's the bicentenary of Waterloo, we had a reunion down in West Wales for his memory this year. Um, but the key thing I really wanted to focus on was this diagram here, which is to show that you can get a Picton pedigree from this particular collection of books called Golden Grove Books. And I'll talk a little bit about these as, as further on. Essentially, they're, they're your equivalent of the Irish Annals or whatever. So it's, it's just really to illustrate that Wales also has this bardic history that you have in Ireland. But I'm afraid not documented to anything like the same extent that you have. Other people have said how fortunate you are in Ireland having this big collection of material. We do have this material in Wales, but not to the same extent. Um, and I'll show some of, some of what does survive later on in the, in the talk. But just, just to make a couple of points, um, there's no dating information on this tree. But by using a combination of other records, you can start to date the people that are on this pedigree tree. And that's true of most of the pedigree trees that survive for Wales. They won't have dates on them. Just occasionally they have dates sort of right down the bottom end, 1685 or so on. So you have to find a mechanism to date the people that are in your tree. And the other thing I point out is the bit at the top where it says Advani Pembrokeshire. And so the Pictons are Advani, and Advani is a Latin word for foreigners. So when the heralds recorded these pedigrees, they knew that this bunch of people with this surname were not the native Welsh people, they were interlopers that had come in. So these Advani pedigree, again, are potentially interesting for people that go out to Ireland because they give you a list of surnames where people have researched, if you like, as Advani. Um, that's just really saying there's been a lot of invasions in Britain. We sort of know that. Um, I did want to just show this thing. Other people have talked about the, the people of the British Isles DNA project, which is where this is taken from. What caught my eye when I first saw it again was, was they, they'd sampled down here in Pembrokeshire in West Wales. Um, and what's interesting about that, and this is a slightly earlier version blown up, is it's been known for a long time down there in Wales, looking at the, the, ling, 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 the linguistics and, and, and the area that it divides into two halves, the north and the south bit. The south bit really is very anglified, and the north part is really very Welsh. And there's a, quite a sharp dividing line between the two in terms of place names and so on, and it's called the Lanska line. And you can almost see the just genetic evidence for the Lanska line. And if I skip through these, that doesn't matter so much. Um, but this is what the people of the British Isles say about the Welsh. <coughs> Three Welsh clusters are most distinctive and completely lack contributions from North and West, West Germany, Northern France, and the largest contribution from West Germany. The Welsh may be closest to the original settlers that came to Britain after the end of the Ice Age, where there is no clear Celtic fringe, and so often assumed there's evidence of ancient British DNA in common with other British populations, especially in Scotland and Northern Ireland, less in Cornwall and Devon, in contrast to what might have been expected. And again, this is what I was talking about, the small differences between South and North Pembrokeshire, especially larger contributions from Belgium and Denmark, are consistent with suggestion that this group may represent the area that is sometimes called Little England beyond Wales. This is because the farmers settled there by Henry II probably came from that part of Europe. So again, um, Welsh is interesting from that viewpoint. It seems to be the, probably the, the oldest genetic homeland left on the UK, and it will be interesting when the Irish DNA Atlas, which is obviously being presented about here, that data comes in to see if it feeds into this model as to, as to what they have. Um, it's unclear though, I said, whether this summary takes account of the Norman invasions and settlement into Pembrokeshire. Um, and there's also settlements by, by the Flemings in, in, into these particular hundreds in Pembrokeshire encouraged by King Henry I. Um, there's a series of volumes that, that are called the Brut, B-R-U-T, and that's, that's the, uh, uh, there's, there's the calendars, really, of Welsh history, which is equivalent to your annals in Ireland as well, that was written down. 
And so they talk about the Flemings coming in, in or being invited in by Henry I around about 1108 into West Wales and settling there. So it's one of the most early, early defined migrations in that, uh, that we're aware of in Wales. And so, I said, that's the genetic, genetic patterns in Ireland. Um, and of course, Richard de Clare, second Earl of, of Pembroke, Strongbow, invaded Ireland in 1169, 1170, almost certainly from Pembroke Castle, Milford Haven, that sort of area there. So Welsh ancestry, there's, it's really quite simple in terms of, of things to look at. Two books like, written by John and Sheila Rowlands. Um, the book really that's essential to buy is, is, is their Surnames of Wales book, which came out in 2014. So I'm not going to sit here and give you a talk on, on the, you know, the history of Surnames in Wales and where it evolves for. It, it is all really in their book. Um, they've, they've had a lifetime of work really thinking about Wales and Surnames and where they came from. But just to give you some idea, you know, patronymic naming, surveys and transitions, um, surveys of names, um, glossaries of surnames, surveys of given names, and so on, for the use of the surveys. And a more recent book, 2015, by a lady called Beryl Evans, who's at the National Library of Wales um, on tracing your Welsh ancestors. So compared to Ireland, Wales has, is probably the best area right now for records online. Got all the censuses, all the parish registers for Wales at Find My Pass. Um, trouble with parish registers in Wales, they tend to start at about 1750. Um, and, and registers before that are, are, are the exception rather than all. Bishops' transcripts begin later. Um, Particularly, we have wills and administrations from the 16th century to 1858, and they can go down to quite lowly people that are there. Um, so again, compared to Ireland, we're that much fortunate in doing it. So again, if you're looking at, at Irish surnames or Anglo-Irish surnames, have a look at those wills in Wales, because there could be migrations that happen from, 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 from Wales into it. Um, Certainly in later records, the chapel records will be very important. Um, they have their own problems in, in find, finding them. Um, but I, I, you know, an example there, um, you, you often find that the, the chapel records that the, the, the parson concerned or, or, or the minister concerned had large areas to look after and had to travel around big areas between various, various parishes. Um, of course, not everything is online. Um, Tithe maps is, is, is equivalent, really, I would guess, to your, your Griffiths valuations that you have over here in, in Ireland. Um, and again, there's, there will be a project um, underway to put most of those online, I think, in the next two to three years. Land tax, again, survives for, for Pembrokeshire for these dates, but doesn't for all, all counties, doesn't survive for Carmarthenshire. Estate records are really very valuable, as they would be in Ireland, to help sort out families. Some of those have been brilliantly indexed. Others of them really say not much more than their 24 boxes of material sitting there. And unfortunately, just due to, as always, the, the state with archives and archivists in Wales, um, the chances of those getting indexed anytime soon is small. So you do need, as always, to find out where your ancestors live and who owned the land. As true in Wales as it is in Ireland. Um, but it can be, can be tricky. And the final one here, again, Court of the Great Sessions, which again, as extensive as the Chancery proceedings in England. Um, prior to 1733, they are in Latin and virtually inaccessible, therefore. I actually went to Aberystwyth this August to try and have a look to break into those, and I can tell you, even with my knowledge of Latin, it's hard going to do that. So there's again, there's a massive material there. It, it covered, you know, a lot of the people in Wales took cases on land and property, etc. There, but they're virtually closed books. Okay, a lot of talk about the history of Wales. Talk a little bit about DNA and a little bit about patronymics to Ireland. Um, there, there are two surname studies running, really, at the moment, specifically on Wales, on, at Family Tree DNA. There's the Wales Cymru DNA Surname Project, with about 600 members in, in, in 2014, and the Welsh Patronymics 
project. And if I look at those in just a little bit more detail, the world's, the world's patronymics, again, designed to establish links between various families of Welsh or in the patronymic systems because um, this could continue up to the 19th century in some part, parts of Wales. So a Williams could be just as equally a Jones, Evans or Roberts. Um, and again, just to give you an idea of some of the sort of surnames that are sitting there in the Welsh Patronymics project. The Wales DNA Cymru project is a bit more selective. These again are a list of some of the, of the names that, that are in the project, 646 members um, as of a couple of weeks ago. And I, that's not complete, as you can see, that, those are the list that there. But the key thing in joining that is you must already have traced your DNA line back to the country of Wales in order to join this project. Okay? So it's a way of discriminating between people <coughs> that actually have real ancestry in Wales as compared to people that think they have Welsh ancestry and join the other project. Having, having, having said that, there are equally ordinary surname projects running covering most of the surnames that are in Wales that are common. Um, I do have to say, if you're a project administrator running one of the common surnames, you need to have a certain fortitude to take those on. Um, it certainly is something that I would be very hesitant to do. I, I have known in my time the person who was running the Williams DNA project. And I remember him saying, you know, I'm spending all my time trying to group people into the right groups. Any thought of having any trees to go behind it, forget it. And again, the last I knew, he had also disappeared. So, you, you know, you need to be very hardy to take on those sorts of surname projects. Having said that, of course, in relation to migration into Ireland, they're probably very important. And the challenge, and I don't have an answer for it, is how you actually concoct a nice story to persuade the people to take the DNA test to do that migration. This is where you're very fortunate, sitting here in Ireland with all of your nice, you know, history that is written down, even if though we've heard from several speakers during the course of this, what is written down and what the DNA actually says are two different things. So that's really me saying it in words. Wales has an extensive and Lombardic history and pedigree has played an important part in the legal system for the Acts of Union. Um, just wanted to mention this guy in particular, David Edwards, he was really the person who tried to bring some sort of order out of this chaos by bringing in the idea of people at the head of the family tree um, and the descendants coming from there, the sort of organization, organization really into tribes. Um, and before that, there was really pretty much chaos in the system, but he was the person to try and bring some sort of order into the system. So as I say, Wales serves as a halfway house in this area, if you like, between England and Ireland. And I want to come on a bit later and mention this work that get, has gone on at, at Aberystwyth University, which relates to Peter Bartram's work. Um, Peter Bartram is one of these people who um, will never see, you'll never see his like again. He spent about 50 years, 60 years, I would think. He died in about 2008, aged 100. And so he went around collecting all of the early Welsh genealogical tracts and putting them up into volumes. So just to do that in terms of you know, reading the documentation, pulling it together, or whatever, it's a lifetime's work. And of course, I'd like to think if you ever did that again, you'd do it with the images and it would be indexed and so on and so forth. Um, but he, you know, he, he, he has a heroic task to do that. Um, And this is just to show, really, there's not all totally gloom and doom in Wales. Um, okay, if, if you take the ten most common surnames, and if you're up here in North Wales, you know, you, you can get almost complete coverage with those ten surnames. But down here in South Wales, and on the borderline, again, those surnames are not so common. So, this is where, I, I think, your pattern of... of, of Welsh surnames may exist that relate into surnames that you can see in Ireland at the same time. And again, the, 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 the Roland who put the, the book together showed this, I think, very impressive diagram where they looked at about 25,000 wills in the National Library of Wales 
scattered across all of the, the hundreds that make up Wales, and, and produced this contour map to show the decay of patronymic surname in, in Wales down to the 10% level. So again, you can see down in certain parts here, again, in Pembrokeshire, in West Wales, the southern part here, the loss of patronymics really happens quite quickly, and in the border areas here to England. Whereas in the sort of Welsh strongholds here, you know, this is Ceredigion and up here in Carnarvonshire, they persist to, to very much later, uh, you know, in, into the 1800s in significant amounts. And again, just to show that the, the, the marcher, marcher lands, that all of this part here are the, are the people that went um, potentially across to, to Ireland from here. Challenges you know you know full well from from, from the, in, the invasions that have happened to Ireland. The people at the top survive; that their names survive in, in the Irish records, and you can find them. The people who went along with them by courtesy of night service do not survive in the records there, probably. Um, so again, the only way you have ultimately to see if they did exist is by DNA to see if you, if you can find connectors back to Wales. And that's just really, that's really just again to show some of the changes that can happen. This is, this is really the rebellion of, of um, Llewellyn at Griffith in, in the 1200s, conquering areas, taking it back, back from the Normans, um, the, the, or the Norman march or lordships. Um, and that's, that's a feature really of, of Welsh history for about the first 250 years under the Normans. You have this fluctuating between the two. Let me just mention then the. Um, the Bartram project. Um, this is running at the University of, uh, on the University of Aberystwyth website, and essentially it takes about um, two sets of, of volumes. Um, Bartram ha had a, a first set of volumes, which was 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 eight volumes, which covered the period from AD 300 to 1400. He then had from 1400 to 1500, and the further 18 volumes plus editions. Um, and again, it's, it's rare to find all of those in, in, in one place. So there's a whole list of editions and corrections that he produced to this list. Um, and when I looked there, I, 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 I couldn't find a couple of lists on the shelves at the National Library of Wales. But again, the, the editions and changes are significant. There is an equivalent of that, to some extent, on family search. They've got a medieval families Welsh project. Um, they're talking about 350,000 indi individuals from 100 AD to 1700, again, based on Peter Bartram's genealogies. The thing is, that's not being added to as I speak to you, so it really is, you know, where it finished. And that's part of this community trees project that they have. Um, on the uh, family search project. I did want, want to mention briefly again, large collection of Welsh manuscripts in the College of Arms in London, again based on these pedigrees. Again, to all intents and purposes, pretty much inaccessible to most people, unfortunately. Some of that has gone into the Peter Bartram collection that I mentioned before, but not all. I did want to show this slide, which is, is from Bartram's collection, which gives part of a list of these surnames that he identified as Advani. So you can go into that site, you can identify surnames that are Advani. This is the one I mentioned, but it gives you some idea of the sort of surnames that are in there. I so said that's a partial cutoff, so you have to go into the full site to see it, but that can obviously be useful. I did want to mention at least one Irish person here, our dear friend Terry. Um, and of course, when I, 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 because of my interest in, in Pembrokeshire, as be clear, I was always a bit surprised to find that Terry, of course, was Irish. Because these Wogans up here in Whiston is a very well-known place in Pembrokeshire. Okay? So Terry is down here. But again, as you can see, this, they've managed to track his family back to about 1800 here in Dublin, the Michael Wogan. And they think he let Lank links in to these Wogans at Rathcoffey in County Kildare. And they came come from a John Wogan, who was a brother of, of the Wogans that I know down in Pembrokeshire. And then ultimately this goes back to Sir John Wogan, again, who I've come across. He was 
pronounce it right, Justiciar, Chief Justice for Ireland, in about 1295 to about 1304. And again, his ancestry through these pedigrees ultimately goes back to a gentleman here, Ugan or Ogan, um, which is the origin of the surname. So again, it's, it, it certainly sh helps show that you can get these migrations of families from Wales into Ireland. If they're at a senior level, they can persist there for quite a long time. And again, all the way down to Terry Wogan. We'll skip that. Those are just the other bits to, to do with it. That's just the history of some of the Wogan family. And that's where it's localised today. Tyrone Bowles maps, even though he's not here, it's very useful in looking at the this disregard with these types of surnames. You can get other surnames that are associated with this. Baldwin's another example, um, which could have come across from, from Wales. And the other one, again, fairly well known, Roche. There's a Roche castle out there in Pembrokeshire. There's a big Roche project. Um, again, 29 separate ancestral branches, but one major ancestral branch. Um, in five minor lineages, and this one represents about 30% of the project, project members um, dating back to approximately 1100 to 1200 AD. And interesting, this is in Hapagu E, which is again is fairly unusual for, for that part of the world. And again, the, the, the field goes on. Um, this is the Welsh and the shaping of early modern Ireland, which is a, a recent book that's come out. Um, I won't dwell on that, but again, it's just to show that people are looking at, you know, soldiers to settlers in, in, in Wales, um, Welsh involvement in Irish administration, um, Welsh and Irish administration, opportunity for the Welsh and Irish administration, Welsh plantations in Ireland, um, communities and networks in early modern Ireland, and, and so on. So, what do we conclude from that? I said, Wales is unique, it's not, it's, not, it's not Ireland, England or Scotland. And like Ireland, with its loss of 19th century material, Wales has good census records, etc. Before 1800, migration out of Wales was not all that common, and it is overwhelmingly a rural community, so if you can localise your Welsh ancestors to an approximate area, that is likely to be their homeland. Paris registers are poor in terms of survival. Why DNA testing would be useful, but, but not essential at this transition. The challenge, as I said, really with Welsh family history is persuading the people to test. You know, for sure, in relation to Ireland, you will have lots of people that will have come across from Wales. You have these wonderful annals that you can write up into a story, although we heard a lot of talks um, to say that, in fact, the stories are probably wrong and, and they, data should look, be looked at other ways in terms of where the surname came from. We can't really pull those that sort of same sort of elements of the story into ordinary Welsh surnames. But I think with the Anglo-Norman surnames, we do stand a chance of getting people to put together the stories. So that's really why I, I, I would be more interested in the Anglo-Welsh stories, because I think you can put a, the Anglo-Norman stories, so I think you can put a story together with the surnames. I think the ordinary Welsh surnames are likely to be really important, but it's going to be really difficult as to how you sell it to people. Thank you. Of interest. How many people have Welsh ancestry in the audience? So we've got one, two, a few people, three, okay. Um, and how many people have uh, done the have you done your DNA test? Are you in the Welsh project at all? No? Okay. Um, any questions for Brian? Welsh ancestry, yes, we have two questions down here, one from Kathy and Dom. Dom has taken the first one here. Brian, thank you very much for the talk. I was just actually just referring back to your map of the the, the sorts of the, the, the British Isles map yeah. and the, the sorts of difference between the North of Wales and the South of Wales. Yeah. And I'm just very interested to, to know, I don't know, one of the speakers that we had here yesterday, uh, Ed Gilbert, is, was talking about the Irish DNA atlas. And sure. I'm wondering whether or not he will ever get enough specimens be able to, to link the south of Wexford with Pembrokeshire and particularly the Fleming signature no. that will be there. 
it, it, it would be obviously fascinating to do that, you know, ever since I said, when I first saw that map, which was up at the Royal Society in 2012, as I said, I saw Lansker line sitting there genetically. And I'm pleased to see when the final paper came out, they also saw genetic, you know, Lansker line. I would like to think, of course, that also influenced their collecting samples down there to see if they could investigate that. You know, they must have thought fairly long and fairly hard about why to do it. You might sit there equally and think, well, what happens in the middle of Wales? Uh, but, but equally, if, if, if you go back in time, you know, that's where all the mountains are. You know, the, the actual amount of, of farming, etc., that went on there was very small. So, again, it, it's a difficult area to sample and interpret just because those are always the lowest in terms of, of population. It, it looks peculiar when you see the map, but if you don't understand any of the topography, then, you know. Well, hopefully they'll get more tricks to the project over the course of the next couple of years. They have 170 in the project now. Um, Jean Piero Cavalieri, who uh, works on the project as well, was saying he'd like to get up around 500 or 600 people. So we've got another few uh, years of recruitment ahead of us. But uh, the more people we recruit, the more granular and finer detail the results will be. So uh, I think we'll probably have a few interesting ethnic minorities falling out of that project uh, in the next couple of years. Just, just to sort of remind everybody that there was obviously a uh, the sort of uh, an old English stroke Fleming dialect spoken until sort of almost historic times in yeah. the south of Wexford called Yola, which okay. had a lot of Flemish words in it. Yeah, I, I, should, I should say actually on, on my way down here I called in and stayed with a lady who's actually got a grant to run, to run a Fle part of a Fleming project looking at that area in Pembrokeshire where, the, where they settled. And she'd actually She'd actually gone to the people in, um, in, 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 the, in Belgium and Netherlands, given them a list of surnames and said, could these possibly be of Flemish origin? She, she's at least trying to do her, do her bit. You know, I, I must admit, I said to her, at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, you're still going to end up running a one name, you know, doing a, you know, a surname study. Um, it, it's unlikely to give you a Flemish signature, but she's essentially gone about it the right way. Uh, we have a comment on that from Patrick Kennedy. Um, well, as a former mayor of Limerick, I'm very pleased uh, with your observations about the Northern family. And uh, we had the privilege of uh, making him a free man of Limerick, so he was very, very oh. much connected with Limerick. And he was a great friend of the days of Richard Harris, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. from yeah. Limerick as well. So I would like to suggest that anything we can do to get both and go or to, to get both and go is really on board. Well, we're very pleased indeed, and thank you for uh, a very fine presentation. Well, you're probably in a better position to get hold of his DNA sample than I am. <laughs> How much do you think? Well, just uh, continuing that, that theme, um, I don't know where this family tree came from, but there's a, a John Morgan who is just this year of Ireland, in the 13th, uh, late 13th century, I think. And there's a book published by Brendan Smith and um, Peter Driver called List of Qu and Inquisitions of Medieval Ireland. Okay. It was published by the List Society. And that is a fantastic resource for all the Anglo-Norman names of Ireland. And John, Do John Morgan turns up all over the place in that because yeah. um, all the Inquisitions are happening in front of him. Yeah. So he, he turns up a lot. But the, um, the, an awful lot of the Welsh names in, in, in that are literally um, Rannoch or, 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 or you know, various versions of Walsh or, or, or Welsh. Yeah, yeah. And, and similarly with the Flemings, they don't they yeah. don't actually differentiate the surname more than that. It, it, it's, it's just a, a name. But there's, there's, the list of inquisitions are probably the best source for uh, Anglo Normans coming at the level underneath the great estate holders yes. in, in, in yeah. Ireland in, in the Anglo Norman period. It's Fantastic resource. Unfortunately, you have to. They, they sell a copy. They sell them in Britain, uh, but you have to order them on Amazon. But you have them here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I enjoyed all of your presentations there. I saw Haverford went mentioned at least twice. You know, in various things there from the uh, the documents that you had in your presentation. Jeremy Corcoran. Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation. <coughs> You're um, Mr. Barton. Is the the equivalent of our North Tusk MacFirbish and yeah. who wrote our great book of Irish genealogy. Uh, fortunately, um, one of our scholars did a monumental work and, and 
Jews sort of from uh, both comment. Uh, is, is there any uh, chance that uh, the Barco um, uh, genealogies will be digitized? Oh, yeah, yeah. Index? Well, you, you may have misunderstood what I said then. It's essentially, you know, he did publish the, 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 the ones I talked about, the, the, the AD 300 to 1400 came out in eight volumes. 1400 to 1500 came out in the further 12 volumes. But again, the number of places that actually bought those were really very small. And then he also published the corrections to go with the volumes as well, which was the slide that I showed there. Um, now, I, 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 think, I, think, I think the, the slide that I showed at, at, at Aberystwyth basically had taken those volumes and digitized them and put them online. So those are there. But, but again, most of them don't have any dating information in it. That's the thing. He divides them by, by generation. He numbers them down from 1 to 15, if you like, from 1 being AD 300 on, in segments of 30. But anything you may find by way of later dating information is not there. And he stops at 1500. And of course, some of the pedigrees go on to 1700 and actually catch up with the wills and so on. And again, you need to look very carefully to, to, to understand those pedigrees can go down further. So, that, that, as always, there's, there's a lot of information buried in there, but you need to read what the content is very carefully to extract the maximum amount of information out of those series of volumes. Will somebody else be taking over his work to bring it up to 1700 where it's possible to do so? At the bottom line, I suspect not. Um, as, as, as always, you know, the library at Aberystwyth got the grant to digitise it. So that was, you know, a £300,000 grant, you know, for four years to put it online. Certainly the gentleman who was the previous, was the previous Wales Herald of Arms, a guy called Michael Powell Siddons, I know sent corrections and this type of thing up there to be incorporated at the early stage. But you know what it's like in, 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 in principle. You know, you, you've got to finish what you've got to do with the grant over that period of time. And these are all the nice-to-do things... But, you know, you're not going to turn the university into a, an academic, you know, chart compiling exercise based on that. So that's, that's the frustration. You, you get block grants to do a particular piece of work, and then, of course, it stops. When do you think they might actually complete that digitization of those uh, genealogies? No, I've, I've said that that's, that's complete, essentially, okay. online from, from that side of the University of Aberystwyth. So, Aberystwyth. 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 so it is online, okay. yeah. You just need to read it very carefully, the bits, as to how to make use of it. That's really... It's not sort of online-like, terribly user-friendly, in my opinion, anyway, yeah. online. But it's better than, than you know, <laughs> the alternative. Any other questions for Brian? Okay, well, it just remains for me to say thank you very much, Brian, for shedding some light on the uh, Welsh Norman connections with Ireland and it's given us some direction to go in search of our ancestors who have Welsh ancestors. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Brian a warm welcome.